Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Uh, today, uh, I review some concepts related to machine learning, which is uh, the cons. Uh, these are the concepts that you might uh, you might to, you might to know for your <clears throat> for your project. First of all, uh, let's just review some general definitions, although these definitions are not uh, biblical, so you might find some, many similar definitions for artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, almost all are related to same topics. Basically, you, you are going to develop or train some models that uh, pro uh, provide some intuition or information from a given data. So this uh, domain is uh, sort of uh, from uh, 1959, but that was a very basic one. Uh, uh, the initial definition was field of a study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So we uh, 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 any programs in Python or, or any coding script. So you define some conditions, and based on those conditions, your code gives you some outcome. Machine learning is just provide an environment and let the model understand by itself. So you don't give yourself any uh, commands for some outcomes, your model does understand what would be the outcomes from some given. That. Also, uh, there should be a measure to judge about the performance of your model. Those measures are usually accuracy, sensitivity, AUC, and based on them, you think uh, you decide if your model is enough reliable for use uh, in a future prediction. These are the three general subdomains of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Can anyone tell me an example of supervised learning? Yes. Yeah, so what you're doing with those models? Those models because we got a and we have a for example, what was your question? And it was a supervised learning or unsupervised learning? Basically, you predict the predictive score, which is the So, for a start, so you have a first data, so that first data has something dependent and one dependent on the other. The here is the stock value. And you try to predict the, uh, the stock value based on uh, your. Uh, the there. So, what about unsupervised learning? Can anyone tell one example of that? Yes, it's a, a, a traditional uh, types of unsupervised learning. So, intuitively, or in the human, what basically the simplest way that can human brain do. Yes, sir, uh, let's say uh, it's very easy for you to uh, categorize your data based on gender, maybe ethnicity, uh, maybe education. These are some uh, variables that you can just uh, use them separately and try to divide your data in uh, two certain groups or certain groups. In unsupervised learning, you use several variables instead of just one or two. And market segmentation is a, a best example of it. So you might uh, uh, you might devise some marketing campaigns and you want to just uh, target people based on their similarity. So you segment your markets based on some certain variables that are important for you. 
So what about reinforcement learning? Have you ever heard of that? It's kind of the newest one is basically, uh, and still in the development, I think all of those domains are in development, but uh, reinforcement are the newest one. Basically uh, your model learns uh, by giving examples and the results of those examples. Let's say, um, I think if you can find some applications of games, so, uh, or you can apply the stock market. So, what would be, so you basically, uh, first it would be a random prediction. So, when you introduce new takes, the model learn from the takes and just improve over the time. Okay, so you're a, I, I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with. Uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, as your homework assignment. Just find an example of reinforcement learning and just explain maybe one paragraph about that example. That should be enough. However, your project, if, I think most of you do supervised, supervised learning, but also unsupervised learning sometimes happens. So. And so the, here the columns are the method type and in the rows you have basically the row are the, uh, you either have continuous data or categorical data. And as you see, based on uh, your data type, you might have different types of unsupervised and supervised learning. Some of them could be common. So, uh, for example, there's a SCR, which is basically based on SCM, and you can use this for the regression. I, yeah, there is another, some part of neural network, you can use for both. Even random forest, you can use random forest for uh, categorical predictions too. So there is uh, basically, uh, there is a good amount of uh, common algorithms that you could apply, uh, apply them in uh, uh, either groups. I think this figure uh, shows uh, the difference, the big, the biggest differences between unsupervised and supervised learning. And uh, so here for supervised learning, we have classification. So we want to see if our dependent variable belongs to blue circles or red cross. So the uh, role of the supervised learning method is just finding the base or uh, boundary that has the minimum error. Here, as you see, I, ha I have two variables uh, for clustering or segmentation. And I just pick, let's say, just the segmentation over three categories. And based on these two variables, I have three categories of observations. Then speaking for regression, similar to linear regression, yeah, uh, you, you try to train a model that has the minimum error from actual observations, which are these uh, green uh, rectangle uh, or squares and the blue line, which is the regression line. So basically the regression line, try to minimize that error. So there is another types of regression, we call logistic regression. So the output of logistic regression is a uh, probability, basically not even logistic regression, all, all the algorithms that you use gives you a P, which is the probability. So here for two class classification, I have a class of zero and class of one for dependent variable. If P more than 0.5, we say it belongs to 
first category or category one, and if it's less than 0.5, we would say it belongs to category zero. Usually the threshold is 0.5, but again, there's some research says that based on some application, people try to change the threshold. Maybe instead of 0.5, they consider 0.3. More interestingly, uh, some people, which are in one of my papers that would come up soon, so I, I, I look at this P, which is output of, uh, I use output of my decision tree. So the output was point, uh, a probability. And I wanted to use that probability for trading. Some of the prediction are near 0 0.5, for example, 0 0.49, 0 0.48, some of them 0 0.52, 53. So some predictions are close to thresholds. Uh, for me, it seems that the, my mother isn't very confident. Is it like uh, way more than 0.5 or way far from threshold or way lower than threshold? So my mother is not uh, enough confident. So what I did, I said all the P's or predictions are close to 0.5. Let's just exclude them. And with those, with the exclusion, I had I could reach a higher accuracy. So well, you would see such a P. So whenever you see a P or a, something between zero and one as the output of your prediction model, just keep in mind, it's something like this that you look at your threshold and decide uh, the category of your observation. A neural network. Look at, let's go back. Simple regression line. Maybe even this one. If I have a, unfortunately, I don't have the marker. So, but anyway, so look. So we have a y as a dependent variable, and we have some inputs b zero plus b one times x. My mother could be could have more than one variable. For example, y could be uh, uh, could be uh, b zero plus a one x one plus a two x two a three x three so on and so forth. So as you see, your input multiplied to some coefficient and you get a dependent variable. You can do you can have some basically here. There is a mathematical proof, and if you ask your friend from math department. They can prove it. In neural network, it's still you have those coefficients, but uh, the way that uh, neural network finds those coefficients is through search. So look, my input variable could be x1, x2, x3. And uh, do you see those lines? It could be a1, a2, a3, a4, up to like, let's say a10. You multiply your input, here three variables, to some coefficient and you reach this layer. The output will be multiplied to another coefficient and you reach to the output layer. So, but what is the differences between neural network and regression line? As I said, this coefficient comes from mathematical proof, but the coefficients that are used for neural network comes from search. So basically, uh, your, uh, your neural network model just assign some random coefficients there and then try to search and improve those coefficients based on some search algorithms. So I might have a neural network with high, highest accuracy, but I cannot prove that the, uh, why I have these coefficients. Just neural network just search and try to improve. It, they are may or may not the best coefficients, but it's not the case for regression. Whenever we see a regression line, since they are dri dri driven for, uh, derived from mathematical formula, we can prove that this is the best line, but it's not the case for neural network. We, we never can say we have the best coefficient. I said this might be a little for uh, upper than the class level, but you can search for uh, some search algorithms and see how people develop such a neural network. 
Let's look at an example. This is a, a website that TensorFlow is actually, uh, I can say, one of the best packages for deep learning. Uh, here you, you see a game that you play with a deep neural network and try to improve your prediction. So as you see, here I have two hidden net layer. Uh, I have two X, I have X1 and X2, I just have two variables. With some, like let's say train to test ratio, noise and batch size. So just let's focus on train to test 50%, noise is zero. Let's change it to maybe 70%, 30%. So 70 train, 30 test. And uh, just let's play it. Look on the right side. Uh, uh, as you see, with, with no noise, uh, my neural network can easily differentiate between blue circles and uh, orange circles. I, I see orange, hopefully I'm not colorblind. Now let's in, increase noise. Uh, what happens? Do you see there is some some errors because some blues are within oranges, some oranges are within blue. But it seems it did a really good job. Maybe if you wait a little more, you have a better accuracy. Anyway, so, so in neural network, when we just have one hidden layer, we usually call it artificial neural network. This is a common name. When you have more than one hidden layer, we call it deep learning. So here I have two hidden layers. So what I do, I'm doing deep learning here. Okay, just uh, as a game, I give you a few minutes. Maybe you go to the link and play. You can just ch uh, change number of inputs, maybe number of increase or decrease noises. Maybe you can add more hidden layer and just uh, change the elements of hidden layers and then see what happens. There is no guarantee because all of them are two search methods. So we cannot prove it, but we just try to see if we see an improvement. So instead of search algorithm, usually they call it heuristic method. So look at this, uh, each node, for example, from inputs, look at the blue uh, stream and you know, orange streams, and the stream just goes from the uh, first layer, or input layer, to the output layer. And you see some terms like weight. Here, weight are those, those, those coefficients that are delivered. First, it was random weights or coefficients. Then a uh, neural network tries to improve those weights. Uh, and the way that it, it uh, to test those weights based on the accuracy of output. Yeah. Any questions?
One of the other famous algorithms is SPM or Stockard Vector Machine. So basically, in the most simplistic way, this algorithm tries to categorize your data into different sections. Uh, but how it does, it just finds a border, which is a, a plate in the like two or three dimensional plate, space. And that border has the maximum uh, distance from each category. Again, it just comes from search, but this is the, so in the previous slide, in the neural network, it just goes from multiplication and finding uh, the rates that the, has, uh, which the outcome has a minimum error. Here, still as a search method, but you find a border that has the maximum distance between two categories of that. Again, no worries. I mean, nobody asks you uh, what are these, uh, but it's a good idea to have a general idea. At the end, you just have some codes that you introduce inputs and derive some outputs. So k-means is one of the most famous um, clustering or unsupervised learning. As you see, uh, it, here I have three clusters, and these three clusters, uh, basic, basically I, wa I want to have three clusters, and then uh, I want to have this cluster, just have, in each cluster I want to have the observation that the highest similarity between them. What I mean from similarity, so I have one x variable and one y variable. Here, similarity just means uh, this x and y distance. And as you see, there's some iterations that seems the border is changing. And look at each, within each cluster, it seems there is a centroid, which is moving, you know? Now the center is here, the center is here, this is here. Look, red, yellow, and blue centroids are moving. But let's see how it works. So in the first step, you identify number of clusters. In the first example, we had three, here we have five. And uh, these are these blue, uh, blue dots. These are, just, again, these are search methods. These centroids are just uh, selected randomly. Then in the first step, we identify the closest dots or observation to each centroid based on Euclidean distance. So for example, here, pings have the, uh, are the closest dots to this centroid. I mean, for this one, it's just a one observation. Greens uh, has the minimum distance to this one, same for red and blue. So we pick random number of clusters and random centroids. Then we assign clusters points to them. Then within each cluster, for example, within each, um, let's say in the pink one, we find the actual centroid. So the actual center of this pink one is something in the middle. For the greens, there is something in the middle, central blue, central red. For this one, there is not that much observation. But uh, again, as you see from two to three, we just uh, change the centroid. Then we I have instead of five random centroids, I have new five centroids. And what I do, I just assign the closest dots to each new centroid. Then again, I come here, find the actual centroid, assign the points. Find the actual, assign the points. Uh, and it goes, the, the iteration goes and goes until the centroid doesn't move that much. If you see that um, my centers are not moving that much, it seems I have the best assignment of observations. As you see, even in this algorithm, there's no math behind of that. We just search through assigning point. Uh, my, our observation to closest centroids. Any questions so far? From people over Zoom. So I think I already talked about 
deep learning. This is one of the most advanced algorithms, but it might look advanced because uh, the search algorithms are very complicated because instead of just one hidden layer, you might have two or three. So you, you just push a very heavy load on your search algorithms of neural network. For this reason, people call it deep learning. And uh, the calculations of deep learning for finding the best ways are the toughest. This figure just explains the simplest deep learning neural network because I, just, I have two hidden layers, output, input. But why people use uh, deep learning is for highest accuracy. And deep learning has a very good performance for image processing. It turn, turns out each hidden layer take care of some certain characteristics. Maybe one first hidden layer uh, is uh, very good for finding, identifying the edges of shape. Maybe another hidden layer is very good for identifying uh, like curve sections. Maybe another one is very good for uh, colors. Here, first hidden layer seems good for picking car second for persons, the other one for animals. So, I still change one. Okay, so look at the first hidden edges, second uh, corners and counters, and uh, object parts for the third hidden layer, and uh, the output is either car, person, animal. Here, it seems it, uh, this, I, you see there is some, it could be this edge, this one could be this edge. This dot could be maybe eyes, I'm not sure, but yeah, so this one is ear, I guess. Yeah, this I see ear or something like that. So again, there's no proof for that. We just, people saw when you use several hidden layers, the outcome, the outcome of the uh, deep neural network has a high accuracy for classifying images. These two uh, general uh, or two domains of neural network, one is convolutional neural network, is very good for image processing or image classification. Recurrent neural network is uh, very good for natural language processing and for sequential, uh, sequential or time series data. In next classes, we have some applications of them. So at least we do some natural language processing. Hopefully if we have time, we use convolutional neural network for image processing. So do you guys remember in the previous semester, we had natural language processing through nine? So you might remember, we had several sections for converting a textual document to a numerical document. So we had a, like, uh, co not complex, but some steps of data preparation for converting textual document to numerical, because these neural networks, even deep neural networks, can just handle numerical data. Same for image processing. Hopefully, if you get to the convolutional neural network, you, so you will see that uh, in the first phase, in the data preparation, you need to convert your images to some numerical equivalents. Then after that, you can implement deep neural network. So, it's the, so even for CNN, RNN, you still need to, uh, to, need to do a um, basically a complex or some steps of data preparation to, uh, for having your numerical equivalents. Any questions? Let's see over Zoom. Yeah, I don't see it.
Yeah, something similar. But this time we do it over Hadoop system or more specifically, we do it through PySpark. So look at this one. As you see, maybe images is, uh, so we need to, I need to talk about it more in depth if we have time. So basically you define some kernels and as you see, it seems that they have different uh, sizes, like uh, 32 to 32 pixel, maybe 28 to 28 pixels, so on and so forth. So uh, basically, you have a matrix of let's say 32, you multiply to its pixel value on each image. So each pixel has a numerical equivalent of uh, blue, red, and green. So there's a, basically some numbers related to each uh, pixel, which pixel means the smallest uh, unit of a picture. So if you see on your computer, so this layer, even this Y has a, uh, like, let's say hundreds of pixels. Each pixel is basically, uh, each dot could relate to a pixel. And that, for example, on this Y, which you see a, a black dot, it just uh, basically uh, has some numbers that identify that pixel is black. So let me show you on the gallery. RGB of black color. Do you see? There is some code. For example, black is 000, white is 255, 255, 255, so on and so forth. So you have different for red, line. So this number just, just shows that each dot on your screen could have equivalent numericals. You multiply to a matrix of different sizes. And this matrix is just for converting those dots, which have different uh, numerical equivalent, to something more simplistic for a uh, convolutional neural network. If you're interested, I think I highly recommend to take an online course for uh, image processing. I'm frankly speaking, I'm not sure if it's very really useful to talk about that because there's so many details about how to make these kernels, how to do modification, so on and so forth. It could be even one or two semester uh, worth of courses. But if you have time, I may just go over some, just one application, one example somewhere. So, some companies are working on, on uh, they tune or they specialize uh, neural network. For example, Google Net uh, is basically is a convolutional neural network package developed by Google. And uh, based on the outcomes of their model, it seems to have a very good accuracy for predicting images. These are four ma major application of convolutional network, image processing, image classification, video classification, image caption, natural language processing. So the easiest one is the natural language processing. You even, you have seen even you can do it in nine because the, the, the data preparation phase is converting non-numerical uh, data to numerical is the easiest one. Easiest or maybe you need just do less amount of steps, but for, and the computation is easier. For image and video, you have a lot of computation. But again, if you just know how to input your data, maybe it's enough. Because there's some people who already develop some packages like Google Net you take care of the heavy part. I think uh, recurrent neural network structure is a little above this class, but you see there is some sequence and basically sequence could be related to time series or 
the time that your data happens. So, recursive neural network uh, uh, gated recurrent units and long short term memories. These are some major order and algorithms. And the applications are for stock market because in stock market you have sequence time series prediction. Still, you can use it for natural language processing, supply chain forecasting, machine translation, and speech processing. So, again, these are based on experiences. We don't, there is no proof for that. Maybe sometimes use SVM and your uh, accuracy is much better than this. Okay, so you might remember in the previous class, we had the local installation of Spark. And uh, we didn't use Spark, we uh, worked with the PySpark coding. So, I cover some of the codes, which is, uh, I think is uh, very general for most of the projects, but, but for your certain needs, maybe you need to look at documentations. And the good thing, uh, since you already had some Python experiences, these documentation are not difficult for you. So let me just look at this documentation. Okay, so if you go to uh, Apache Spark, as you see, there is two section MLlib uh, for, so, okay, first one is just for data sets. It's for data set that you know, that are in, are in the uh, tables of row and columns. The case, second one is RDDs. This is different uh, structural data, which is phasing out. It used to be the uh, major Spark, uh, basically, first of all, ML or machine learning packages of Spark first develop over RDDs, but they are not common that much, so people are not focusing. So our focus is MLLib and over data sets. For example, let's click on classification and regression. So So look, for example, logistic regression. When I go down, there's a scala. This is one, uh, one of the uh, codings in a Spark. You can do Java, Python, or R. For Python, you can find some examples. Let's say if your project, you want to logistic regression, you can just come here, look at the documentation, explanation. You can just copy and paste and use it for your own project. Decision tree. So let's say if you need decision tree, come to Python, select the section that is relevant to you, copy and paste. Maybe you need to change a little bit of the code, but since you already have the Python and some machine learning courses, it shouldn't be too difficult. I even if you look at them, it seems a lot of similarities with Python. There is some certain differences which we cover later. But if you find those differences, the, the remaining part is super easy. Even in some sections, they talk about some mathematics behind of them or some uh, algorithmic sections, how those, they develop those models, like super, uh, Linear super vector machine, which I just talked about it, how we can use it for uh, classifying our that. Uh, we will cover the good amount of this package, MLLib, but it's still, you know, it might, we don't have time to cover everything. Just come here, try to find the relevant section and use it for your own project. So yeah. This weekend? Yeah. So, I mean, the first report is super easy. You just need to find a data set. Anything. So, if 
do you guys is it uh, just look at your previous uh, course with me which was uh, uh, business intelligence is exactly like that but this time our environment is uh, spark and the coding is different so, um, can you again the, um, description and I mean, exactly, but the first one, uh, you don't have to do those uh, descriptive statistics. Just talk about your data set, your passion, maybe some, you have some hypothesis in your mind. They should be enough. Again, this is your uh, PySpark Bible. Even I see they improve. Every year, there's some improvement in these packages, like pattern mining, filtering, clustering. I've seen that they are just adding to the packages. Uh, still, is this one is still under development. Okay, what would be the next step? Well, we already work with the virtual box and local installation. I don't, I'm not that much a fan of virtual box. There's a lot of difficulties, even if you don't have a very good PC, sometimes it takes forever to launch. So most of my teaching would be over Databricks, which is just uh, a cloud-based PySpark environment. And when you go into Databricks, you see some Jupyter notebooks, which already set. So it's, you just need just copy, uh, just put your codes there, run your project, and it's enough. Since, uh, I mean, you need you need to have some extra skills, especially if you want to succeed in the job market. Most of co uh, companies, especially if you end up startups, usually they, they have contracts with uh, a cloud-based uh, computing services like Amazon AWS Azure. Amazon AWS is the most famous one. I teach you some skills how to do uh, uh, your PySpark codes through Amazon AWS. If you'd want to do a pro group project, you can do over Databricks, local installation. You need to have to over through platforms. One could be Databricks. The other one could be either Amazon AWS or you do it over your local installation. Basically, Amazon AWS and local installation are almost the same. Instead of local host, which you had in the local installation, you have Amazon, like aws.amazon.com. So just the address of the service is different. It's very good to practice Amazon AWS and have those skills. Um, there is a catch, which again, I, I they talk about it later, sometimes, uh, which almost ha always happen. So they uh, they tell you that they provide a free service, but they find some good ways to charge you. But every semester, students contact them and say, we want to, we just did for our class project, usually they forget. I never saw they, uh, they never forgave any student. But just, just keep in mind, so if you do a local installation, definitely no charge. Amazon AWS, they might find a way better for for-profit companies. So even when sometimes when they provide free services, it might be some like, you know, for example, when you accept, so they give you some conditions which you accept, but usually people don't read. Uh, again, maybe even if you read, they still you need to learn it. So, uh, but. It's really, really interesting. I think every semester student gets charged something between 200 to 500, but at the end, they just, nobody pays. It still is a good uh, uh, skill. And I definitely encourage you to learn uh, how to run your codes over Amazon AWS. But in case, again, if you want to do a group project, 
you need to pick two platforms. Databricks is the easiest one. You don't want to see any issues. Sometimes uh, still you might get some issues. So again, this is a Databricks is totally free, no charge. But sometimes, uh, I think the last semester we run uh, some this cloud-based service, and sometimes we cannot run it because it seems so many people are using and they have limited resources. Let me show you a bit of Databricks to see how easy it is. I show it uh, more details later. So basically, same as email address, you have an account. So I'm just clicking and like, let's say class cluster. I just uh, run a cl uh, cluster over a spark with 3.12. Then I go create notebook. Okay, it seems I already have that notebook. So let me just new class. Look, uh, nice job. So fast, so easy. But again, sometimes you might get it may or may not run. Is a and usually I, I never saw they they don't charge you. They don't get any uh, credit card information from. Still, I think in terms of skills, I highly recommend to blend both local installation and Amazon AWS, which is very similar. Even for do you guys remember for VirtualBox we use Putty to transfer data? We do same for local installation and uh, Amazon AWS. Still, you need to have a Putty. You provide the address, login, and password, and you send to your that. Local installation is, is the one that I taught you last week. So you had Hadoop as well. But again, all of them are most similar. You, you need you have a server. That server could be on your local system or over the cloud. You need to connect to that server and run your code and get the results. So uh, let's just do it later. So, so again, no worries if, especially last week or the week before that, when I talked about VisualBox, you had a lot of difficulties. For your project, you can just do it through Databricks and you don't want to face any issues. So a good amount of our sessions, in a good amount of our sessions, I bring some notebooks and we go over notebooks and learn some coding through some hands-on experiences. Meanwhile, I also teach you how to work with Amazon AWS. And I, I might have another session for local installation because we already have Hadoop and Spark, but we didn't, yeah, I, I didn't show you how to send your data and code to local hosts and how to run your calculations. It's not difficult, similar to VirtualBox, but maybe. I just wonder if you have any code how to use the data in the Amazon uh, uh -huh. I'm just saying that this is like the platforms that you can run your project. Any questions? So you you have you will have a, a one assignment about reinforcement learning. Again, just find one example and talk just talk a little bit of that example. I post this assignment later on. But other than that, I think today's evening, some most of, hopefully all of you are busy with the Valentine Day. So let's just close for today. And happy Valentine Day. So enjoy your rest of the day. So let me stop sharing and...